Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Shar McDonald, Senior Vice President of Public Policy and Government Affairs at Care First, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's event on consumer privacy. As our world becomes more connected through technology, increasing amounts of sensitive data are being collected from consumers, including consumer health information. Congress understood how important it was to, to protect consumer health data in a digital world when it enacted the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, in 1996. While HIPAA includes strong consumer protections for covered entities, this framework does not apply in all situations. Today, we will discuss what safeguards do exist to protect consumers' data and what gaps exist in the regulatory framework. While we're accepting questions through the Q&A feature on Zoom, we may not have enough time to get to all of them. If we don't answer your questions, uh, rest assured that someone from the public policy and government affairs team will follow up with more information. With that, I want to introduce you to our moderator, Care First Senior Vice President and Chief Digital Information Officer, Dory Henderson. Dory leads Care First digital transformation efforts, having held similar roles at Collins Aerospace, a division of Raytheon Technologies, and Boston Scientific. Over to you, Dory. Thanks, Char. Um, very excited about the discussion today. I anticipate that one hour from now, I am going to be a lot smarter as it pertains to the privacy of consumer health information. Uh, before I jump into introducing the panel, I thought I would just take a moment to level set on the why. Uh, why is this so relevant today? More relevant than it was a year ago, two years ago, and that, that relevance continues to grow. Um, I think many of us believe that HIPAA provides broader protection regarding the privacy of our health information than it actually does. It's a pretty bold statement and something that we've seen come through with strong visibility in COVID-19. Right. We all saw professional athletes invoking in response to questions on their vaccination status. The reality is the law does not apply to that. So that begs the question, if that's what's happening, then what does that mean to me, the consumer, to us out there in this broad ecosystem of the digital space? Right. We all know that we are living in this digital world with unlimited applications, unlimited devices and so many healthcare products and services available to us via websites that are just ge generating so much additional personal health information. Well, luckily for us, we have three panelists with us today that have the expertise and the perspective to be able to answer specifically, what does this mean? And talk a little bit about privacy through the lens of consumer health information and also address how policymakers can protect consumers going into the future. So allow me a few moments to introduce our esteemed panel. I'll start with Commissioner Kathleen Berain. Commissioner Berain is the Maryland Insurance Commissioner. The Maryland Insurance Administration is an independent agency that serves as the primary regulator for insurance markets in the state of Maryland. Commissioner Berain also chairs the Innovation, Cybersecurity, and Technology Committee of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Prior to her appointment, Commissioner Berain was a partner in the Insurance Sector and Litigation and Regulatory Practice Group at the law firm of DLA Piper Limited. Welcome, Commissioner Berain. Nice to have you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Wonderful. We also have Danielle Lloyd. Danielle is the Senior Vice President for Private Market Innovations and Quality Initiatives at AHIP. AHIP is the national association representing organizations that provide coverage for healthcare and related services. Previously, Danielle led Premier's policy analysis and development activities working with lawmakers, policymakers, and other major stakeholders representing the interests of more than 3,500 hospitals nationwide. Welcome, Danielle. Thanks for having me. All right, and Manisha, we have Manisha Mithel. Manisha is a privacy and cybersecurity partner at Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati. Manisha is an internationally recognized expert on privacy and data security. Previously, Manisha spent more than a decade leading the Federal Trade Commission's Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. In this role, she oversaw a team of 40 lawyers responsible for the enforcement of privacy and data security laws and development of a broad set of policy positions related to technology regulation. Welcome, Manisha. Great to be here, thanks. All right, uh, that was a mouthful. I had to make sure I really followed this. You guys have accomplished a lot across the three of you. 
So I'm excited about the discussion, and I think we need to level set on just the basics on the education. So what is HIPAA, right? What does it cover, and how has the framework helped protect consumers' data thus far? Uh, let's see. Danielle, let's start with you. Sure. Um, that's that's a pretty big thing. <laughs> so um, let me try to uh, think about organizing that. Um, I went to my middle schooler's uh, parents' day the other day, and they reminded us of the value of the five Ys. So I think maybe that's uh, five Ws, right? Uh, so maybe use, using that. Um, I think, you know, as you did, Dory, starting with the why, um, you know, the, the HIPAA law was historically very appoint, important because it did, you know, sort of two major things for the first time in the, in the healthcare arena. The, the first thing it did was standardizing the administrative transaction. So what does that mean? When you think about a provider asks a payer to pay them for a service, right, you have to exchange that information. The reason that was important because it reduces costs and burden and um, errors, right? The second thing was around um, consistent technical and physical safeguards for protecting consumer data. Um, so that's the sort of administrative simplification piece. And then the second piece is really, you know, rules around privacy, security, that sort of thing. So when we think about who it applies to, um, there's something called covered entities, and those are your providers, right? Your hospital, your physicians, et cetera, your insurers, and something called clearing houses. And clearing houses are these vendors that sit between the payers and the providers and help them with some of those transactions like the claims payment. Um, what also happens is that those organizations that those covered entities work with to help them do their daily business, they become something called business associates and sort of the rules of the covered entities kind of cascade down to these organizations because for example let's say a plan works with a disease management organization they may end up being uh, privy to some of your you know uh, personal health information um, so in terms of uh, the what and, and I will just say on the who right it's a fairly small, you know, to your point, Dory, right? It's a very small number of organizations, and I'm sure we can get into that more later. But in terms of the what, it's around this protected health information. And that can be, um, you know, there's many different fields, but your name, your address, your driver's license number, you know, if they have your fingerprints or, um, you know, the diagnosis codes for what kind of treatments you're getting, that sort of information is sort of in the scope. And it's, it's those things in your, essentially for the provider side, your medical records, right? And on your insurer side, your, your health insurance provider's record. So that's sort of what it's covering. If, if we think then about um, the how and sort of what, what are they actually doing, right? Um, I would point out one thing first is that there's uh, information can sort of be freely shared if it's for the purposes of treatment, payment, and operations. Treatment and payment, I think, are pretty clear. Operations might be something like um, fraud and abuse activities, right? Making sure that um, uh, that's not going on, um, quality improvement uh, and measurement of providers, uh, et cetera. So that can sort of happen freely. Other things might need some, some authorization. But the two sort of big things it, it does is it gives consumers um, certain rights, and then it has certain principles and restrictions on how the data is used, right? And so when you're thinking about the consumer piece, you know, we all get that that note, right? You got to sign for it. Probably not that many people read it or take it home. I, I have a file of all of mine, uh, but I know I'm a little bit of an odd duck in that respect. Um, but you know that it, ha it has to tell you some about how your data is used in, in those forms. You also have the ability to access your records. You can ask for corrections if you see something's wrong. You can um, request res restrictions on, on how your data is used. And you can also, um, probably a, a little known fact, ask for an accounting of disclosures. So who did that covered entity give information out to? And that second piece is around sort of the restrictions and the, um, you know, principles around good governance of, of your data. Um, you know, one of those is, is what we refer to as minimum necessary. So 
you know, when, when, uh, you know, someone's asked, you know, between the, the payers and providers a specific question, you don't just send over the whole thing, right? You send over what's needed to answer that uh, question. And the rules also prohibit the sale of individually identifiable information. You can't do that. Health insurers wouldn't do that anyway. <laughs> but what you can do is you can sell um, information that's been aggregated in a way or, or de-identified. Um, and so an example of that, right, is you wouldn't put somebody's name on it. You would randomly generate a number so they wouldn't know who. Or instead of your date of birth, they might only give the year, right? So ways in which they can make it so you can't get back to, you know, who an individual person is. And the reason that this is important is it's uh, used by researchers and, you know, trend analysis and other things. So it's it's something that is, uh, you know, really necessary. And, um, you know, the other thing I would say in terms of, of where, which is sort of a little bit of an awkward uh, uh, question on this, is I think that's where sort of the security standards come into play. So if you think about physical safeguards, you know, who can access a building, um, who can get into certain rooms, right? You know, ways in which you can protect, you know, the, you know, paper information or the, the servers that, that they're on, there's those sorts of safeguards are required, as well as more technical safeguards, um, like, uh, you know, electronic safeguards. So think, two-factor uh, authentication and encryption of uh, the information and restricting who can see what, right, depending on their role to, to meet that minimum necessary concept. Um, but I think the important to remember here, again, to your question, Dory, is there's sort of all of the data on you, and then there's healthcare, and then within that, there's a subset of this insurer-provider uh, clearinghouse business associates that it applies to. So it's, it, it is um, that component, right, um, is where sort of it ends um, in terms of HIPAA. And, you know, I think the other thing you asked was around, um, you know, it as a, as a regulatory framework and, and how well it's performing. And, you know, we really think that HIPAA is a, is a strong regulatory framework. It's by and large governed by the Department of Health and Human Services and the Office of Civil Rights. Not only HIPAA, but successor laws that have come and built off that, like um, the High Tech Act, don't ask me to spell that one out. Um, but, but that, for example, introduced the notion of uh, breaches and cyber some of the cybersecurity issues. But it's a very transparent process. If you um, have a breach, you know, using that as an example of 500 or more individuals, you have to tell the individual, you have to tell HHS, you have to tell the media to make sure you're getting the word out, right? Yeah. It's less than 500, you report it annually to the HHS, and it's all sort of publicly up on a website. And that transparency really lets you see that, you know, we're monitoring, we're identifying, we're correcting, and if we don't, we're getting penalized. <laughs> so, you know, I think we think it's a, it is a, a really robust framework. Uh, good news. I would say, Danielle, I mean, just listening to you talk, the sheer volume of information that you just shared around HIPAA, I think it's going to go a long way. Hopefully just the next hour will help demystify that for, for some. So I'm anxious to talk a little bit more about that. And also you talked about purchase of data, which is a sensitive topic for many, and we're going to dig into that here in a moment. Before we leave this topic, though, Commissioner Brain, is there anything you want to add with regard to how this are protecting health data? Sure. Um, well, I think one of the things Danielle uh, made very clear is that is, is two things. First of all, that HIPAA is a federal baseline for privacy protection. So states cannot enact laws that would reduce what HIPAA has set as that baseline, but they can certainly add to it, and some states have. So you look at where states may have more enhanced features or scope, um, so that's an important area to be aware of. Um, the second thing is that HIPAA has its limits. So uh, it doesn't apply to all health information, and it doesn't apply to all entities that have health information. And so there are state laws that seek to remedy some of those gaps. So, you know, for example, you can look at what the um, National Association of Insurance Commissioners have uh, has done 
you look at, um, I guess, NAIC model 672 is probably the one that's most um, applicable here. Uh, it was originally adopted after uh, in 2000, after the passage of Graham Leach Bliley. It applies much more broadly to, I would say, um, personal financial information, but there are sections that also deal with um, personal health information. It's been pretty widely adopted in some format. It was most recently changed in 2017. Some states have adopted the new um, model, others have not. Um, but essentially what it does is it governs the treatment of non-public personal health information um, by licensees of state insurance departments. And it describes the conditions under which a licensee can disclose non-public health information and non-public personal financial information about individuals to their affiliates and to non-affiliated third parties. There's a carve out for compliance with HIPAA. So if you are an entity that is required to comply with HIPAA, then you are not subject to um, the health, non-public health information uh, sections of the act. But in those instances where HIPAA does not apply, this steps in to part of that gap. And then obviously there are other, you know, individual laws in Maryland, for example, you know, has a, um, a privacy law and the commercial law article that applies broadly to all businesses. It also has a deemer, if you will, carve out for entities that are required to be and are HIPAA compliant, but it can apply more broadly um, in, around the edges. Um, and I would say the only other thing I would mention specifically with respect to the states is that, um, you know, high tech did authorize state attorneys general to enforce HIPAA. And so you see more um, HIPAA compliant actions that are being pursued by, uh, you know, attorneys general. Um, and, and I should not fail to mention that the NEIC is currently reviewing both um, model 672 and a prior model, model 670, which is very focused on um, health insurance, but it was not broadly uh, really adopted by many of the states. But, you know, the NEIC, like, you know, many um, governmental agency entities include, well, not that the NEIC is a governmental entity, but as the sort of the place where governmental entities at state level come together to think about what we need to do, the NEIC is working through a um, revision of its models to modernize and make more comprehensive and sort of bring into uh, regulation appropriately the kinds of things that we're talking about right here, right? Where there are real gaps, and I know we'll get into this later, but you know when we begin to think about the health Internet of Things and what what laws apply or don't apply, and what are the clear areas and what are the gray areas, those are the kinds of things that we hope to be able to address, at least in the insurance sector, with our models. So, is the bottom line here, and I think what we all agree to, you know, HIPAA is a great baseline; it's a great starting point, but there is basically a big hodgepodge of regulation that exists at, you know, particularly at the state level, and there are significant gaps. And we need to figure out how to have a more comprehensive, consistent approach to privacy and security of health information. Thanks for that. And I think, you know, your, your comment about hodgepodge of regulation, I think that was clear and what came out there. And I think it's a good segue into maybe uh, from a federal view, Manisha. So we've been talking about the states and this hodgepodge of regulatory um, views. Besides HIPAA, how is the federal government regulating health data? Um, so um, it's a great question and it comes up a lot um, in our practice. We have a lot of digital health clients and just to give you an example to frame the discussion. Um, so we have uh, digital health clients that say, I wanna offer a consumer a health app directly to the consumer I want to offer it through their employer, um, paid for by you know, insurance, and I want to offer it through their doctor's office. I want, you know, I want the healthcare provider to use my app to you know, help consumer manage their diabetes or whatever condition it is. And the client says, how do I know what laws apply? What do I do? Um, and, uh, and so what we advise the clients is at the federal level, um, you know, the, when we talk about the app that's provided directly to consumers or through a consumer's employer, HIPAA, necessarily, uh, HIPAA doesn't necessarily apply, but there is a federal law that applies, which is the FTC Act. And 
Um, and just if you look at it in terms of a Venn diagram, uh, the FTC has jurisdiction over a range of sectors in the economy. So you could be an entity that's covered by both HIPAA and the FTC. You could be an entity that's not covered by the FTC at all. So for example, the FTC doesn't have jurisdiction over insurance companies. Uh, or you could have, a, a, or it could be an entity that's covered solely by the FTC and not covered by HIPAA. So, um, so what does that mean? So um, what does the FTC Act require? Uh, it basically prohibits deceptive and unfair practices. Um, a deceptive practice is where a health app or a health data broker or any kind of company uh, misstates what it's doing in collecting data, using data, or sharing data. And just to give you an example, the FTC recently brought a case against a, a fertility and menstruation tracking app um, called Flow Health. And what the FTC alleged is that Flow uh, told consumers that they wouldn't be sharing their sensitive health data with unaffiliated third parties. Um, and the FTC alleged that they, in fact, did share that data with companies like Facebook and Google. Um, and so the um, FTC entered into an order with the company, which required the company to have certain restrictions on their um, on the health data that they collected. It required the company to provide notice to consumers. So that's kind of the deceptive side. And there have been a number of cases involving health apps. Um, there's a um, There were cases against Rite Aid and CVS, which the FTC brought in conjunction with HHS arising out of data breaches several years ago. Um, so the second area, uh, the, I also mentioned unfair practices. So an unfair practice is one that causes substantial injury to consumers or competition that's not outweighed by benefits to consumers or competition. So basically a cost benefit weighing test and any action that harms consumers without imposing corresponding benefits could be an unfair practice. And this quintessential example, example of that is data security. So if a company doesn't implement reasonable procedures to safeguard consumers' information, they could be subject to an FTC lawsuit for a violation of unfair practices. So there are examples dating far back where the FTC has brought cases against companies I mentioned, Rite Aid and CVS. Um, there's other companies like uh, Accretive, um, which was a, um, a medical debt collector. There was Core Blood Registry, which was um, you know, collecting uh, core blood of, of newborns. And more recently, there was a case against a company called SkyMed that was providing um, you know, travel reimbursement services for people who fell ill while abroad. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the FTC Act. Um, there's also another law that the FTC enforces. Um, Danielle mentioned the High Tech Act. That included a provision um, for something called the Health Breach Notification Rule. And it provided for enforcement against covered entities by um, HHS and enforcement against non-covered entities and non-business associates by the FTC. And that's been somewhat controversial in that the law originally applied to vendors of personal health records, which was actually a quite narrow subset of entities. These are entities that were providing consumers with the ability to build their own personal health record, combining information from their various medical providers. But just last year, uh, the FTC essentially broadened its interpretation of the health breach notification rule to say that it essentially covers all health apps and all health connected devices. Um, and so that's been somewhat controversial because you know there's a it doesn't quite fall within the letter of the statute. Um, but it, I think it remains to be seen. I think companies will challenge the FTC on that. But uh, just as a general matter, if there is a breach, if you if you're a health app or connected device that experiences a breach um, under the health breach notification rule and the FTC's interpretation, you have to notify consumers. Um, so that's just a broad overview of some of the federal laws that apply to non-HIPAA covered entities. Fantastic. Thanks, Manisha. So all three of you have done a great job setting the landscape on coverage regulations with regard to privacy on health data. So we're going to go the other way. So we've talked a little bit about covered entities and business associates and and regulation they have to follow under HIPAA with regard to privacy of health data, but what's not covered by the law? What are some examples that are not covered and what does it mean to the average consumer? Who wants to go first with this one? I mean, I can, I can take that. I think just as a corollary to my prior answer. So consumer facing apps, um, you know, menstruation, fertility, health, wellness, um, you know, um, track your, um, uh, oxygen saturation rates, track your blood sugar levels. If they're offered directly to the consumer, they're not um, covered by HIPAA. Um, Internet of things, connected devices, um, you know, your Fitbit, um, things like that. 
um, behind the scenes, there are non-consumer facing entities like data brokers. Um, so data brokers are often collecting, sharing, using, buying, selling health data. Um, and that's not necessarily covered by HIPAA. Um, and so these are all things that would be covered by the FTC Act, but that are not covered by HIPAA. Now, if you go back to the Manisha saying, you know, Venn diagram and what I was saying before, right, you've got the, the, the big data, the health data, the HIPAA data, yeah. right? It's sort of everything outside of, of the HIPAA uh, punch out, right? Um, and and HIPAA couldn't, you know, part of, part of the reason for this, right, is HIPAA couldn't contemplate things like the internet of, of things, uh, right? Because it did, you know, those things didn't exist. We couldn't think about all these different ways in which we would be collecting data and just the sheer volume, right? We're at exabytes now, right? We're going to have to learn a new vernacular right. for the size of data. I'm not really sure what that means or how big that is, but it's, it, it sure sounds big, but, you know, just for some, some specific other healthcare examples, you know, if you're on a search engine and you're searching a treatment or, you've got a smart bed and, you know, like I do, I turn off the privacy settings. You're going to see I'm a little bit of a nut on these things <laughs> as I give these anecdotes, but, you know, your smart bed transmits information on your, your sleep habits, your, you know, grocery store can track what food you're buying. The pharmacy can track if you're, you know, buying a pregnancy test, right? So I think, I think you can see that it's, it's really pretty ubiquitous. It's sort of, we're at a point where you can't really um, sort of, exist in society without having some data collected on you. And some of that is going to be healthcare related because the definition of healthcare related is obviously bigger than, than, than HIPAA. And, and these organizations can use the information in ways that, that we can't um, under HIPAA, as long as it's in those terms and, and agreements. And, you know, we all kind of flip through and check because, you know, who can really understand and read that. And frankly, you need the convenience and you, 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 you might have to, right? You know, the schools required us to use certain apps uh, during the pandemic, and some of those were not uh, protected sufficiently, um, at, least, at least in my mind. But there's sort of this assumption in people's head, right? There's, even if you don't understand every last detail in your HIPAA privacy notice, you, you kind of come to rely on understanding that there's like a, a more robust level of protection under HIPAA but not really understanding that, that that does end, right? And there's this balance of information that's flowing. Yeah, exactly. I, think, I was gonna say, I think the thing that I, only other thing I would add, because I think it's been very thorough is, um, and you know, Manisha mentioned this, is when there are gray areas, right? So when I go and I buy my Apple Watch or my Fitbit or whatever it is, that's not gonna be covered by HIPAA. However, if my health plan has a wellness program where if I do certain things, I'm entitled to a Fitbit and that Fitbit has certain software on it that's providing information, you know, in some way, perhaps back to my health plan, that's a gray area, you know, that that's gonna pull things into HIPAA. So, you know, we have to be thoughtful, you know, from the standpoint of what the source of that device might be and whether there are special applications or special software on that device because they're connected to, you know, a health plan or a provider. So it's a, there's, it, it is the Venn diagram. It's clearly yes, clearly no. And then, um, gee, maybe it depends. You know, and, and I'll raise one other example, which is, which has been very much of interest to regulators in the last couple of years, and that's employee privacy. Um, and so you mentioned the pandemic, Dory, and, you know, I, there was this whole kind of employers collecting temperature checks. There was kind of, you know, discussion about that. Um, and so both at the federal level, the FTC has expressed a lot of interest in kind of worker surveillance and, and employer practices involving worker surveillance. And at the state level, there were previously exemptions under California law for employee data. And now those ex exemptions are set to expire uh, on January 1st, 2023. And so I think, you know, that's another bucket of data that people need to think about in terms of the employee health privacy. That's not necessarily covered by these other laws. But it also a sort of differentiation, right? Is HIPAA is around who holds the data, right? A specific entities, right? What we're talking about, and what I think people assume, is that it's what data you're holding, right? 
and that if it, if you're holding healthcare data, it applies, right? And that's that's not the way that the system works right now. That's very very interesting, Danielle. I mean, I, I think I even I myself am thinking things of things very differently. And I think what all of you are talking about, and everybody on the call here is thinking through their brain, all the apps that they're using, and how they're engaging with regard to their health data. And so this has been a really fantastic conversation around the type of data and as a consumer, what we should be aware of and con concerned about, quite honestly. But then it leads to the second piece that people are concerned about. And I'm going to I'm going to read this. The American Medical Association found that 92 percent of people believe their privacy is a right and their health data should not be available for purchase. So, Manisha, you mentioned data brokers. So let's dig into that a little bit. Um, can people's health data be purchased? Yeah, so if you think about it, and I think this goes to Danielle's point about, you know, what data is health data and so much data about our purchases uh, can be used to infer health data about ourselves. Um, so just in, if you think about the breadth of sources of data broker information, so they have access to, for example, public records, court records, motor vehicle records, press articles, um, you know, census data, um, birth certificates, marriage license, divorce information. And so you could glean a lot of information about, you know, um, is somebody going through a stressful time in their life? You know, the, the divorce records, you can, um, you can get press articles about them, about kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, accidents, you know, accident data, for example, um, you know, somebody was in a motorcycle accident, et cetera. There's other publicly uh, available information. Um, there's also um, consumer consumer provided information, things like Facebook likes. Um, so let's say you kind of um, uh, like a particular you know healthcare organization, or you like um, you know a, a, a particular healthcare group. That's another kind of area where data brokers can glean information. And then the final category is just passive collection of information, as you're just doing your searches on the web, and as you're going to various websites, uh, companies can get a lot of health information about you. And I think the classic example of this, this was in the press several years ago, is the um, example of um, Target uh, finding out that uh, a woman was pregnant based on the purchases that she made at Target, um, and essentially finding out she was pregnant even before essentially she knew she was pregnant, um, or her family knew that she was pregnant. And so um, so really you can take, you know, it's not that I'm going to collect piece of health data one, piece of health data two, piece of health data three, and combine it and, and get this information. It's that I'm going to combine non-health data piece one, piece two, and piece three, and piece that together to infer health data. And so I think a lot of data brokers are involved in that practice. Interesting. Anything to add, Danielle, Commissioner Borain, to that one? Yeah, I can, I can go next. Um, I think, so first of all, I thought that AMA um, research was interesting. We we did some of our own research in 2020 with Morning Consult and, and consumers to get their perspectives. And, um, you know, I think two, two points are instructive here. The first is that 62% of the adults who were responded um, thought that privacy protections were more important than easy access and you know when weighing the two and then secondly 90 percent of the respondents thought that tech and other companies like that uh should be held to comparable standards uh like like protected health information under hipaa um so i think those are really uh important but you know you know again i just want to quickly stress, you know, take home message that I'll probably say five times, right, is the, the covered entities can't sell the individually identifiable data, only the de-identified or uh, aggregated types of data. Um, but I think, you know, it was interesting, there was another FTC lawsuit, I think it was just in, in August, and um, I, I fear going down this route because Manisha probably knows more about this than I do, but uh, th they were alleging unfair trade practices when a data broker um, sold consumers precise geolocation. Um, and, you know, so it basically they were selling their movements and where they went, right? And that included places, you know, sensitive information, right? That inferring step. Um, so that information was sold with the phone ID. So it doesn't necessarily have your name, 
But once you have the phone ID, as Manisha is saying, you can buy other sources, right? That can help you then convert that phone ID to a person. And, um, you know, that, that information was showing if somebody spent a night at a homeless shelter, if they were going to a psychiatrist's office, they were going to a, a woman's re reproductive health clinic, uh, as another example. And so part of this is, I think, you know, as Manisha is saying, is this sort of daisy chain of, you know, one particular information may not be healthcare, like, like geolocation, but you can put it together with other things and you can make inferences that then basically reveal um, aspects of, of your, your health and your healthcare. Yeah, I think that's really, all of those things are critical and, and they're sort of, it, 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 it hits me in different buckets, right? So the first thing is the idea that you have a large number of people that say that they think their privacy is a right and they expect that privacy to be protected and they expect to have government protection. But how does that translate into behavior by those same people, right? Because those same people will click through every single notice without reading it and accept every privacy sort of um, you know, constraint, which may or may not exist on an app or a website or a social media site without going in and fixing their privacy um, settings or really even understanding or realizing how to do that. So there, there, there is certainly a growing um, desire among people to control privacy and it is generational in nature because um, you know, you have people that are younger are more used to and more willing to have more of their information available and they don't necessarily care or they don't think they care about the ability to piece things together and find things out about them. Um, I'm not sure that that's always gonna be the case. I think that um, the reversal of Roe v. Wade has changed a lot of people's perception um, about where they might be tracked and what they might be doing. And people are, you know, have real concerns um, with respect to that, even from a, the potential for crim criminal prosecution in some places. But there's a disconnect between a belief and a desire to have privacy and then understanding how to address that. Um, and there may be a call for governments to step in and dictate, right? But government has to be careful about what they dictate because that's a balancing act as well. Because we certainly want to encourage the useful use of data and devices in order to achieve things that are truly helpful to consumers and to society, while at the same time creating, you know, practical, useful, and enforceable laws around what can be used and what can be shared. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a careful balancing act. So I, I, I hear what consumers are saying, but we have to think about what are they doing? And then what really is government capable of policing and protecting? And, and I, I think that's a great Fair point. point. And I think it's a great <laughs> microcosm right. of some of the debates that are going on in Washington over federal legislation on privacy um, in the sense that I think there's a concern that we are putting too much of a burden on consumers to understand the ways that data flows and kind of asking them to make informed choices. And so I think there's been this concept around the duty of loyalty with the idea being that you know, companies have an obligation to be responsible stewards of data that they're collecting about, um, uh, about consumers. And so things like making sure that they have um, strong data security measures to prevent unauthorized access to data. Number two, making sure that they are only collecting the information they need and not collecting information um, and, and not retaining it indefinitely so that it could come, come up with some sort of secondary use later. I think there will always be a role for consumer choice because consumers have different preferences and some consumers are willing to make trade-offs and some consumers aren't. Um, but I think we can take out a lot of the noise by um, having these responsible data use practices where companies are um, you know, asked to have security, minimize the amount of data and, um, and just be responsible stewards of data. Can I just add a little bit to that? Um, you know, certainly from the health insurance provider perspective, we, you know, recognize um, that consumers 
need to be able to have access to their information, right? And we want to facilitate that. But we think that we've sort of set up a false choice here, right? A sort of dichotomous approach of you can have access or you can have privacy. And we think it really should be a both and, um, and think that there are ways that we, you know, can accomplish both. Um, so I, I think that's sort of the piece where, yeah, you can go and turn off a lot of various privacy settings, but in some cases, you know, that's, that's not going to get us all the way to uh, real privacy. And, and, and that's just kind of just one example I just want to raise while we're on this topic. Um, so the FTC brought a case against a company called Practice Fusion a few years ago. And this was a, um, it was a medical, it was a doctor review uh, site. And what they told consumers, you'd go to your doctor and you'd get this message from this company, Practice Fusion, that said, provide feedback to your doctor. And what the FTC alleged was that, the, that they didn't disclose that not only would you provide the private feedback to your doctor, but that this was information was used to populate a public review website for doctors. And a lot of people had thought that they were sending private messages to their doctors, so they included sensitive health information. But what was interesting about that case is that if you clicked on the kind of terms of use, there was actually a HIPAA authorization um, that explained kind of the real deal that this would be to populate a public review website. But the FTC said the disclosure wasn't prominent enough. And so it was still a deception because the disclosure was buried. Um, and so I think that kind of when you're talking about choices, the choices have to be informed, they have to be clear and conspicuous, they have to be prominent, and consumers shouldn't have to hunt and sift and peck for them. So, um, so I think it's a really important point when talking about notice and choice. It's not just kind of, you know, provide the kind of lengthy authorization and have a signature and be done with it. And it's sometimes in reality, you don't really have choice, right? You know, back to what I started to say earlier of, you know, a, a colleague of mine, the school was saying, please use this app to share your vaccination status for your children with the school. And lo and behold, they find out later, you know, this is not a, a specific HIPAA app and they're, they're, they are uh, potentially selling data, right? So sometimes, you know, there there is that like practical reality of it's not always really a choice. And how do we, you know, a, accommodate that in some sort of framework? Well, and I think for the, from a practical standpoint, too, as you say, you know, I just spent, you know, $200 on some device, right, which is the nifty new thing. And so, you know, I open it up and, you know, the first thing that comes up are 400 pages of various pieces of information that you have to click through. Um, and, you know, sometimes you have to pretend to scroll through it in order to click through it. So what are you going to do? Are you actually going to read them all? and say, oh, you know what? No, that doesn't work for me. So I'm gonna pack this up and send it back to the store. Of course not, nobody does that. I don't do that. Daniel, you probably do that, <laughs> Danielle. <laughs> but I don't do that, right? Like people don't do that. So it, the disclosure and the notices are all important if they're prominent and if they're readable, which they're not. Okay, I'm a lawyer and I don't understand what half of them say. But the other part of it is that, you know, what is the role of um, sort of constraint, the kinds of things that you, that you have to do or you're prohibited from doing regardless of notice and permission because data use permission is not a full consumer protection. So having a, a notice in there and you've now given me permission to do these 12 things, not necessarily the way to assure that consumers are protected with respect to their data. And you know, while we don't need to micromanage everybody's personal decision, there are some really clear guardrails that, that need to be there. And, um, and there are big gaps in that. That's a great conversation. And I, I, so I think this is a, it's interesting because, so you guys, now we've covered a little bit around covered entities. We've talked a little bit about the apps and, and websites and from a digital perspective, so much that is largely unregulated. So just to provide more clarity then, and we've touched a little bit this, Manisha, when you were talking about the doctor's office, but if we talk about covered entities specifically, is data they control protected from these apps and others in the ecosystem that are exchanging health data for profit? Kind of bringing those two things together. Well, how's that, how does that extrapolation work? I can start on that one. Um, so there's a couple different layers here, kind of going back to our event diagram, right? So 
as as someone pointed out earlier, I don't remember which one of you, but um, you know, the apps that are sponsored by your health insurer um, or your health care provider that include some of the information in your medical records, right? Those are HIPAA, HIPAA covered, HIPAA, HIPAA protected, right? So not all apps are created equal, if you will, right? Um, so if you're, you know, you're getting your price checks there and your, uh, you know, what claims have been paid and educational materials, right? That's in. Um, and I think Commissioner Brain uh, pointed this out, but sometimes there are, is data that's outside of that bubble that comes in to the covered entities, right? To augment their data. So they, they do, you know, buy some data. So let's say we're missing some of the race, ethnicity, language, et cetera, data, or maybe social drivers or something. They might take that information and augment their systems with it so that they have that information to identify disparities, offer additional services, et cetera. But once that information comes into their records and into their systems, it's all treated under HIPAA, right? The worry is the other direction. So when you had information that was protected and you're sending it out. So an example there is uh, there's some, some federal rules called the interoperability rules, right? Where we're trying to, to share information uh, more seamlessly across uh, different entities um, to support you know, consumer access. But the way that this is structured, right, is you download an app and it says, hey, this app could be really much better if you put your provider data in or your, your health insurance provider data in. And so you say, okay, that sounds, that sounds great. That sounds cool. And it sends you over to the health insurance provider and you sign in with your credentials there. And th this is where the federal, <laughs> a former federal official said, this is where you now need to put on your websites or in that part. Blinking flashing lights would say, leaving the land of HIPAA, <laughs> right? <laughs> because as soon as you check that box, right, it's out. And when I say out, it's not minimum necessary, right? It is the whole kit and caboodle of your claims and clinical information that's in certain formats that the health insurance providers have, right? So once you check that box, the spigot opens and it's literally all out there. Um, and so... That's where you know we are are particularly worried that people are not going to understand that transfer from inside HIPAA to outside HIPAA, and in that information, obviously, then at that point, can be sold to brokers, and so it picks up that whole conversation of brokers and sort of what what they can do and that daisy chain of it's now going into that sort of broad profile, right? And so this this is where we think you know, it can't just be within those entities. It's got to be who's holding the data and it has to be carried throughout the, the ecosystem in terms of those protections. And it can't just be this false choice of you either get to use things or, um, you know, or it's private and one or the other. Yeah, I, I guess just to pick up on that, I guess I, I would, I definitely think I, I agree with Danielle's point that like the, you know, it's it, consumers don't know when their kind of protections diminish, you know, whether they're HIPAA covered or not HIPAA covered. I don't know that it's such a dire picture outside of HIPAA. I mean, I do think that there are, you know, federal laws, there's the FTC Act, there's state laws. So the flow example I mentioned, you know, if, if that kind of, let's say it's like a, a personal health record. And all of a sudden, they're selling information to data brokers without telling consumers. I think that would be a violation of the FTC Act. But I take the point, and I think that is where we do need comprehensive federal privacy legislation to beef up those outside of HIPAA protections. But I do, I do think it's important, right, in that a lot of the data we've been talking about was sort of we're inferring some things around you. This is different in that it's literally what your treatment was, you know, where you got the services, you know, all, all of that um, information, right? And so I think that makes it more dire than it has been heretofore because it's really that specific information. And I also very much worry that, you know, the FTC is, is, is you know, really enforcing more and it's great, but when you, when you use enforcement as your stick, it's too late. The information's already out there. You can't put that genie back in the bottle, right? So part of what we need is 
you know, sort of more authority there to get to be upstream and create some rules upstream of, of needing that enforcement component. Couldn't agree more. The other piece of that is that, you know, there's two things. One, when you're at the FTC level, at least with respect to, you know, uh, it the, the focus there tends to be around um, misrepresentation, right? So not really accurately describing what it is. I know that there are various prongs, but the core is typically that your notices were inaccurate. You you fail to accurately describe what you were doing under the with the data. Um, so sort of a false pretenses approach, but that's not always the case. I mean, sometimes people are very clear about what they're going to do with the data, but the consumers don't read it. So yeah. it's it. You know, we we sell your data, and but someone's clipped through that, so they've never noticed it, and so you know, it, there's not a a false pretense there. They've been clear about it, and you know, to Danielle's point, that's where um, you know you you have more concerns, and even outside of the FTC, when we get to the state level, the degree of state laws, you know, so, you know, a state like California is a bit of an outlier. Other states have not really followed suit in that same way. Connecticut and, Connecticut and Vermont, you know, have uh, more directly regulate uh, data brokers uh, and, and have requirements about, you know, notices and, you know, reporting to the states. But for the most part, those laws are not really very well developed in the states. And so, they, like the FTC, may be focused more on um, either uh, misrepresentations or on uh, breaches. So many of the state privacy laws tend to have very broad statement about protecting information and then, you know, notice and outreach with respect to um, when a breach occurs, as opposed to setting a set of new privacy standards. So there is, a, I think, a significant gap that exists, and you're right, Manisha, whether, you know, how dire it is and the distinction between, you know, whether it's really actual information about someone's use of health care or health care status versus what people are able to piece together to make assumptions and conclusions about someone's health status or health care needs based on other non-health data. Yeah, and I think that the FTC has, and to your point, Kathleen, I think that has been a criticism of the FTC approach that they've focused on kind of deceptive misrepresentations. And it's interesting because I think there's been a couple of things this year where the FTC has kind of put out a marker and a shot across the bow, so to speak, with the Kachava case that Danielle mentioned about kind of selling geolocation information in the background. There is no misrepresentation there. Um, and the FTC also put out some guidance post um, Dobbs um, talking about how sensitive um, how health information and geolocation information is sensitive. And so I think there's a recognition that they're going to be doing more outside the misrepresentation space. But I 100% agree that there needs to be legislation to fill in the gaps at the federal level. And I hope that's something that Congress will work on. Well, and this court has made it pretty clear that it is uh, more wedded to the precise language of you know, the, uh, <laughs> the statutory uh, law. And so, you know, to your point, I, I agree with you. The FTC has said there are things that they're going to do, um, but as you noted, those things are going to be challenged. Yeah. And um, I don't. Uh, I, I, if I had to guess, I would say this court might not be as open to kind of the um, the penumbra of what the legislation may have uh, authorized. Chat around the use of VPNs as a way uh, consumers can keep their data private. And I think, um, you know, that's a, a good question to sort of explain a little bit about, you know, that, you know, you're using it a VPN, um, you know, you're not, it's more secure, right? Um, but that doesn't always translate to it being private, right? So you could be using a VPN, but if you using that VPN asked your uh, health insurer to send that information to that third party app, you know, and it can then be sold all perfectly legal, right? Uh, but not so private, right? All very secure. It's not going to get hacked as it's going through the system, but at the end of the day, it's still not private. So there's sort of an interaction between the privacy and security uh, piece. Well, and the other, the, that is absolutely correct. The other thing that we have to also seriously entertain and deal with is the fact that telehealth 
has proven to be a critical tool to serving consumers. You know, we learned that uh, that lesson was brought home in the pandemic, but it is absolutely crystal clear that it has such an important place to, to place in delivering healthcare. And yet, the only reason that telehealth has been effective is because the, um, the federal government is not enforcing some of the security rules around the use of various devices and methodologies, which I think is going to be extremely problematic if those enforcement you know, begins again and consumers can no longer, for example, utilize FaceTime or utilize you know, certain uh, types of devices that are uh, easily available to them. So that's gonna take us on a whole other journey, right? Around when you have a consumer that desperately needs to communicate in a particular way and they are limited in their communication devices, how do we make sure that they're able to communicate at, while protecting things appropriately, but not allow those, those important protections to prevent people from getting the access that they need? Fantastic. Well, ladies, we are um, out of time. This has been really educational. I know that I've learned quite a bit. So I want to thank the three of you so very much for the time. I know you all are very busy and have a lot on your plate. So really appreciate you guys stepping in here and chatting with us today. Big thank you to everybody who joined. And I would just remind everyone that this is part of a series of events hosted by Care First. And uh, our next event will be in December, where we'll be discussing Medicaid redetermination. So again, thank you all so very much and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you.